Whether you're battling swarms of genetically engineered killing machines in the grim darkness of the far future, or you just need a convenient place to store your flag, there's almost nothing the Templin Institute recommends more than armored fighting vehicles. Those familiar with our operations will recognize that we're talking from experience on this one. But tanks are not without their challenges. They require constant maintenance, their tracks are always getting clogged with mud, and sometimes you end up standing directly behind one while trying to record some footage, and you're blasted in the face by an insane amount of diesel exhaust, but you don't want to ruin the shot, so you just stand there, and by the time you're able to run outside, your eyes are watering so badly it looks like you're in complete hysterics, which is especially embarrassing because you're surrounded by active duty members of the Canadian forces who are all very polite, but you can tell they're very amused by what's just happened. Anyways, what was I saying? Oh right. All these problems and many more have finally been solved by the sponsor of this investigation, War Thunder. From the boundless waters of the Pacific to the turbulent skies over Europe, War Thunder allows you to take command of over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and warships, and nothing less than the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. In dynamic, combined arms, PvP battles, vehicles from the 1920s to the modern day come to life in a highly immersive combat experience. They even have the Leopard C2, the very tank the Templin Institute commanded just a few weeks ago. And as a stickler for realism, War Thunder really speaks my language. The vehicles are incredibly detailed and modeled all the way down to their individual components, with an incredibly sophisticated damage model to match. We're not talking hit points here. Instead, you'll get to see exactly just how bad of an idea it was to blunder over that ridge completely blind and with no smokescreen, thanks to a damage x-ray showing you precisely what that enemy round did to your vehicle, your crew, and maybe your pride. But on the flip side, when you're the one in the superior firing position, you'll be able to see exactly how smart you were to aim for the ammunition storage. But of course, the coolest part of owning a tank is being able to make it your own, and War Thunder has it covered there too. There's an in-depth customization system with hundreds of options, historical markings, and paint schemes. Try out War Thunder for free on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, or the previous console generation. And when you do, you'll get access to a whole host of bonuses from boosters, backups, and premium vehicles. So thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this investigation, and I'll see you on the battlefield. A day may come when the skies of holy terror are darkened by clouds of mycetic spores its great bastions shattered beneath the weight of enormous tendrils that stretch into orbit, and the last vestiges of man's presence on its home world are swept away. Such a fate has already befallen countless Imperial planets, each one home to billions of men and women, who even as the spores fell and defenses crumbled, refused to accept that their existence in this reality was over. It is foolhardy to believe that Terra is above such a fate, nor is it inconceivable that its ultimate destiny may be as merely another dead world in a galaxy stripped of all life, a silent husk left in the wake of the ultimate predator. Should that day ever arrive, it will be the final chapter of a story that began in the 745th year of the 41st millennium, with the start of the First Tyrannic War. Within the distant frontiers of the Eastern Fringe, the Adeptus Mechanicus had established a research outpost on the oceanic world of Tyran Primus. Amongst their fields of study was the dissection of Tyran's immense marine predators, geotechnical investigations, and the exploitation of geothermal energy. The outpost itself was a labyrinthine complex meticulously constructed across an ancient chain of volcano islands. It hosted a series of super-deep boreholes that extended miles into the planetary crust, ostensibly for geospatial mapping, but additionally as a method of shielding sensitive warp studies from cosmic rays. Tyran was not the only such outpost dedicated to this research, merely a minor node in a galaxy-spanning network of Mechanicus facilities. By every metric, Tyran was not exceptional or even remarkable within the Imperium's enormous research apparatus. Tyran's position, however, on the extreme edge of Imperial space necessitated a far more capable garrison than would otherwise be assigned to an outpost of its size and importance. The facility itself was as much a fortress as a laboratory. Its structures extended deep into volcanic rock, 
and were fortified against the tropical hurricanes that ravaged Tyran, as well as the occasionally hostile native life beneath its savage oceans. To ward off the raiders and pirates active throughout the Eastern Fringe, four anti-void ship defense lasers had been constructed across the volcanic chain, each enclosed within ceramite silos and void shield generators. These were supplemented by three dozen autocannon or las cannon emplacements and overlapping rings of fire bases, trench lines, and bunkers. Their arrangement had been expertly overseen by Mechanicus artisans and concealed throughout the beaches, volcanoes, and jungles that surrounded the outpost. The garrison itself consisted of a mixed force, an elite unit drawn from the Scatari legions of the Mechanicus and a far larger infantry regiment of the Astro Militarum. Additionally, the Tyran outpost made a convenient headquarters for anti-piracy operations throughout the Eastern Fringe. The Imperial Navy had stationed three full wings of Thunderbolt heavy fighters on Tyran, as well as a flotilla of three Endeavor-class light cruisers that conducted routine patrols throughout the planetary system and its closest neighbors. It was these patrols that discovered the first evidence that an immense new Xenos threat was encroaching on the Eastern Fringe. Since the outpost's construction, Mechanicus Explorators had conducted regular studies of the surrounding planetary systems and had detailed information as to their native Xenobiology. But in the 74th decade of the 41st millennium, patrols based out of Tyran had reported that worlds supposedly teeming with life were now completely barren. Explorators later expanded on these reports, noting that every trace of life, down to the bacterium, was simply gone. Dozens of worlds were soon found to have been stripped of all biological matter in the same manner, and reports were sent to the Explorator General of the Administratum. Though peculiar, these reports were ultimately deemed to be of low priority, and no follow-up investigation was ordered. In the year 745, M41, the cause of these anomalies had arrived on the outskirts of the Tyran system. A hive fleet, the first of its kind to arrive in the galaxy, and what would later be classified by the Imperium as Behemoth, had been replenishing its biomatter in the surrounding area of space. The myriad of primitive worlds it had consumed replenished its biomass after a long extragalactic journey and it was now fully prepared to engage a more sophisticated and advanced type of prey. By sheer accident, the Imperial outpost on Tyran was given a degree of warning. A survey ship, returning from another planetary system stripped of all life, emerged from the warp in a cloud of unidentified organic matter that had enveloped the edge of the system. It was quickly crippled by some of these objects, whose functions resembled those of void mines, but were clearly organic in nature. It limped back to Tyran proper, and when briefed on the interstellar situation, the outpost prepared for some kind of Xeno siege. When Behemoth arrived in orbit just days later, Tyran's planetary defense lasers immediately opened fire. The concentration of alien ships in orbit was so great that the batteries fired ceaselessly for over an hour, their effectiveness unclear due to the sheer volume of matter above them. Just as the defense lasers showed the most dire signs of overheating, their barrels close to melting, the Xeno swarm in orbit mysteriously withdrew. Believing this new enemy to be little more than mindless beasts, the ruling tech priest of Tyran ordered the three Imperial Navy cruisers under his command to pursue and harry the retreating Xenos. This retreat, however, had been a ruse. The moment the Imperial cruisers had moved beyond the protective envelope of the planetary defense lasers, the swarm suddenly turned and the cruisers were ripped apart in a matter of moments, almost too quickly for a distress call to be sent. The attack on the planet resumed, and it was clear that the initial attempt had been nothing more than a probing attack conducted in such a way as to reveal Imperial strategy and capabilities. The tempestuous skies of Tyran were overwhelmed, with the fire of the defense lasers only intermittently effective against a foe that seemed to know their precise fields of fire. Organic drop pods fell in such numbers 
that the seas of Tyran appeared to boil at their impact. They quickly turned red with blood, and the beaches were full of horrifically mauled oceanic life, attempting to flee the confines of the sea. What next emerged from the oceans and the organic drop pods that had landed on the island chain itself were like nothing ever before encountered by the Imperium. A towering wave of creatures, each one a swirling mass of serrated claws and sharpened teeth, scaled even the tallest bastions of the outpost. Wherever they met the Imperial defenders, the Xeno suffered unthinkable casualties, from disciplined las cannon fire or auto cannon rounds, until the ground was covered in their corpses. In the skies above, the Imperial fighter wings and every other ship fit to fly carved through the swirling masses of flying organisms, their broken bodies falling like rain. But the success would never last. As if a single command had been addressed to the swarm in an instant, the Xenos would suddenly and violently shift tactics. The barrels of the defense lasers were clogged with their bodies until they couldn't fire. The Thunderbolt's engines were choked with spores and blood, and even veteran guardsmen of Katachan were out-hunted by a species that seemed aware of every human instinct. A full year later, when the Imperium of Man had finally dispatched a relief force, the fate of Tyran was revealed. The oceans were gone, along with every trace of life. Like the planets in the surrounding sectors, it was just another barren rock. Deep within one of the boreholes, among the few remaining traces of the Imperial presence on Tyran, a Mechanicus Data Codex was recovered. Within was a full record of the planet's defenses, from the first sightings of the Xeno Swarm on the edge of the system, to the breach of the last command bunker deep within the facility. Amongst the most startling details encoded into the Codex was that from the time the first landing occurred, the defenders of Tyran had held on for barely a single hour. Embedded within the relief force was an Imperial Inquisitor, Fidus Cryptman, whose exploits during the suppression of the Makarian heresy had made him a favored agent among Imperial power brokers. Though the annihilation of Imperial outposts under mysterious circumstances was hardly unusual, the thoroughness of Tyran's transformation from a verdant oceanic world to a barren planetoid intrigued the Inquisitor. He determined these new Xenos to be a grave threat to Imperial interests, and named them Tyranids in a grim acknowledgement of the first human world they had consumed. Cryptman sent warnings to Imperial authorities across the Eastern Fringe, which quickly proved to be prescient. But as High Fleet Behemoth began to advance from the outer frontiers of the galaxy, into densely populated and developed Imperial territories, no manner of defense proved sufficient. More star systems went silent. The garrisons of Hive Worlds, Forge Worlds, even Fortress Worlds, and every other category of Imperial planet proved as incapable in resisting the Tyranids as those on Tyran. In each instance, Cryptman's forces arrived too late to assist in the defense or observe the Tyranids directly, his only evidence of their approach was limited to more dead worlds and void ships left adrift, their crews missing, and hulls scorched and battered by what seemed to be exotic acids and terrible claws. Much of the difficulty encountered by Cryptman in getting ahead of the encroaching swarm seemed to result from a strange, unprecedented type of phenomena in the warp. Communications and travel through this alternate dimension of pure psychic energy were unreliable even during favorable circumstances, but the navigators, astropaths, and sanctioned psychers aboard Cryptman's vessels reported a new kind of interference. Connections to the warp were increasingly smothered by a seemingly random yet consistent psychic signal, emanating without any discernible pattern or frequency. Blinded, deafened, and now slowed to a crawl by this shadow in the warp, Cryptman slowly discovered that his warnings to now-dead Imperial worlds had been garbled, misinterpreted, or never received at all. An attempt was made to use an astropathic relay station in the Thandro system, specifically designed to overcome warp interference, but when Cryptman arrived, the station was adrift. The Void Station, 
like the Imperial worlds encountered by Cryptman before, had been stripped of all biomatter, and its arsenal completely expended. Mining stations situated throughout the system were similarly silent and completely empty. Cryptman still lacked a clear picture of the size and nature of High Fleet Behemoth, but in studying the positions of dead worlds left in its wake, he was able to accurately project its course. Once the relay station over Thandros was repaired and contact with the wider Imperium established, Cryptman's reports and the recovered data codex from Tyran were hurriedly analyzed. Agreeing with Cryptman's own assessment and recommendations, he was directed by the Ordo Xenos of the Inquisition to make all possible speed for Ultramar, the greatest bastion of the Eastern Fringe and the most formidable obstacle in the path of High Fleet Behemoth. Up until this point, what would become known as the First Tyrannic War was hardly a war at all, rather a series of surprise attacks and massacres against unprepared, isolated Imperial worlds. Most suffered from widespread corruption within their governments, deteriorating infrastructure, and severe negligence in every level of their defense forces and military institutions. Ultramar stood in stark contrast. Once a deeply integrated Imperial satrapy known as the 500 Worlds, its worlds and star systems had retained their close connections, sophistication, and capabilities despite the dissolution of their overarching administrative structure. In practice, the entire Ultramar subsector was also the stellar empire of the Ultramarines, one of the Imperium's most vaunted Astartes chapters. Now fully aware of the impending threat, Marnius Kalgar, chapter master of the Ultramarines, assumed total command over the Imperial response. His efforts were focused on Macrag, capital of Ultramar, and one of the most fortified sites within the entire Imperium. Though the Tyranids would be engaged at every opportunity across the 500 worlds, the task of breaking its momentum would fall upon the defenders of Macrag alone. Ultramarines across the galaxy were hastily recalled to the defense of their homeworld. They were joined by contingents from their successor chapters and countless other Imperial units who in the preceding millennia had pledged themselves through oaths and blood to the defense of Ultramar. Every Imperial institution with assets in range of the subsector rerouted them to take part in the defense, from Astra Militarum regiments to a full legion of the Collegia Titanica. In orbit, the battle barges and strike cruisers of the Ultramarines assembled, likewise reinforced by elements of the Imperial Navy and even merchant vessels hastily repurposed into gunboats or fireships. The bulk of the Imperial defense, however, consisted of units mobilized from the Ultramar Auxilia. Unlike other planetary defense forces present throughout the Imperium, whose role was often limited to a single planet, Ultramar's local forces were organized under a command structure that extended throughout the entire subsector. The Auxilia's size and capabilities were accordingly far greater, one of the most well-trained and supplied defense forces in the Imperium, resembling more the regiments of the Astra Militarum. For solar weeks, the Imperium assembled its forces in Macrag, even as the outer systems of Ultramar reported contact with Behemoth. Inquisitor Cryptman himself barely managed to arrive before the shadow in the warp engulfed the region, reporting to Marnius Kalgar the insights he had gleaned from studying Behemoth's advance. This would be the first real effort to stop the Tyranid threat, and neither man knew what small detail might prove to be invaluable in the coming effort. The first concentrated attempts to stop Behemoth were unsustainable, and quickly developed into hastily organized retreats and meaningless slaughter. Prandium, the jewel of Ultramar, and famed across the Imperium for its perfectly engineered gardens and forests, was amongst the first to fall, swiftly joined by Kalth, a world that had fiercely resisted the traitor legions during the Horus Heresy, only to be seemingly overwhelmed in a matter of days by the Tyranids. Everywhere Behemoth made contact with Imperial defenders, the results were disastrous, and most critically, failed to buy time for the ongoing mobilization effort centered in Macrag. Most concerning was the realization that the Codex Astartes 
the great tome of military strategy penned by the Ultramarine's Primarch, Rabute Gilliman himself, failed to possess any insights into how such an unprecedented foe might be beaten. The fierce hit-and-run attacks against the High Fleet, as well as the bold yet doomed attempts to reinforce those already under siege, were abandoned, and the static lines in Macrag reinforced. The capital of Ultramar had made use of every second afforded to them to prepare, but the shadow in the warp had left its defenders blind to events outside their system. The fate of Battlefleet Bracca was of pivotal importance. The Imperial Navy's high command in Segmentum Tempestus had ordered almost the entirety of their forces to defend Ultramar, but as the first Tyranid organisms entered the boundaries of the Macrag planetary system, it remained unknown if they were still en route, had been diverted elsewhere, or had perhaps already been destroyed. The battle for the homeworld of the Ultramarines opened in much the same way as the fall of Tyran, albeit on an exponentially larger scale. The Tyranid Hive Fleet swarmed into the system from multiple points, the sheer number of organisms rendering the Imperial defense confused and disjointed. The initial plan had called for Imperial warships to take station alongside Macrag's Star Nova class orbital weapon stations. With concentrated bastions of immense firepower, Marnius Kalgar hoped to delay any landing on Macrag for as long as possible. This quickly proved untenable. Every Imperial strongpoint within the system found itself immediately engaged in a battle for its own survival, unable to assist one another or coordinate their fire. Countless Tyranid bioships were destroyed, but the flood of Behemoth was so great that landings occurred across Macrag almost immediately. Wave after wave of Tyranid organisms smashed against the orbital defenses, while just as many slipped through gaps, their progress barely impeded by the rapidly developing orbital battle. On the planet itself, Imperial forces had been divided into three army groups. Two of these were based on each of Macrag's polar fortresses, continent-sized bastions defended by immense batteries of anti-starship weaponry. With orbiting Imperial naval forces so quickly committed and overwhelmed, the polar fortresses represented the last major asset able to assist the battle in orbit and stem the tide of further Tyranid landings. The last army group, personally commanded by Marnius Kalgar, would act as a more mobile force. It would simultaneously exploit any opportunities to delay the Tyranid advance on the poles, and prioritize the destruction of the largest Tyranid bioforms that seemed to act as officers, or perhaps relays, for whatever consciousness was directing their attack. Kalgar was at first enormously successful in this, swiftly destroying Tyranid landing sites before they could develop into established beachheads. Yet, it was clear that such measures could only delay what appeared to be an inevitable slaughter, especially as High Fleet Behemoth began to exhibit even more unusual and sophisticated tactics. Sirocco Starport, a pivotal assembly point for the Imperial Navy, was almost overrun by a strange new form of Tyranid infiltrator, leaving its critically important fleet of transatmospheric shuttles devastated. No longer able to as rapidly redeploy, the army group under Kalgar took positions across Cold Steel Ridge, an enormous industrial complex that stretched across the northern seas of the planet. Though the complexities of the Tyranid hive mind were barely understood by the Imperium of this era, it was undeniable that whatever was in control of High Fleet Behemoth had recognized the importance of Kalgar. As he continued to hold off the Tyranid swarms at Cold Steel Ridge, specifically engineered organisms, were deployed to neutralize him. Kalgar failed to grasp the change in the enemy's tactics until it was nearly too late. He was lured into the open by the destruction of the Pride of Hera, a defense auxiliar baneblade that had served as a linchpin on its local sector of the defense line. Moving to reinforce the now vulnerable position, Kalgar and his bodyguards were ambushed by swarms of Tyranid creatures that were thought to be dead but had in fact merely remained motionless for hours. Larger Tyranid bioforms struck down the Chapter Master, who was quickly evacuated back into orbit. 
the battle barge Octavius, in which the grievously wounded Calgar now made his new command post, was one of only a few vessels that had survived the onslaught of Behemoth. Most of the orbital defenses had been destroyed or had their ammunition supplies expended, while whatever void ships remained could only harry the vast swarm of Tyranid organisms that continued to land on the planet. Every spaceborne asset present in the system had been fully committed, and no reserves remained to challenge the invasion of Macrag proper. On the planet itself, the polar fortresses continued to hold, though the Tyranids had achieved their first initial breakthroughs across defense lines that ringed the installations. Even the Titan Legion assigned to their defense were overwhelmed and destroyed. The forces available to defend the polar fortresses were quickly diminishing, the obvious prelude to a much larger effort by the Swarm that would surely see both sites of resistance overwhelmed. At terrible cost, Kalgar organized the remnants of the Imperial battle groups in orbit into a single, battered force in which to make his final stand. Astonishingly though, in this pivotal moment, Tyranid bioships began to withdraw from the planet, seemingly unwilling to bear the firepower still emanating from McCrag's terrestrial polar batteries. Their maneuver gave Kalgar an immense opportunity to deliver a massive punishing blow as the swarm moved to reorient itself. But wary of Cryptman's reports, he soon recognized the action for what it truly represented. A feint intended to draw out the remaining Imperial warships, just as had occurred over Tyran. But whether intending to sacrifice his remaining warships while inflicting the greatest amount of damage on the enemy, or somehow given warning of the events that would follow, Kalgar's force moved into the opening High Fleet Behemoth had created. The Imperial battle group pursued the Tyranids to Circe, an outlying gas giant in the planetary system, devastating the swarm's fleeing bioships along the way. Just as Cryptman had warned, however, a second Tyranid force lay hidden in Circe's rings, and now swarmed out to overwhelm the isolated warships well beyond the protective envelope of McCrag's planetary guns. It was Behemoth that found itself trapped, however. It had moved glacially slow through the shadow in the warp, but now, in this pivotal moment, Battlefleet Bracker exploded out from the warp and into real space, hundreds of warships of the Imperial Navy now perfectly situated in the midst of High Fleet Behemoth. A savage void engagement erupted again as Imperial and Tyranid reinforcements flooded into the outskirts of the system, neither side possessing a significant advantage. Behemoth, though, seemed poised to accomplish its immediate objective, utilizing its significant numerical advantage to deny Imperial reinforcements from aiding the Krag. Since their emergence into the galaxy, the Imperium of Man had fought High Fleet Behemoth with every weapon available to it, from virus bombs and cyclonic torpedoes to a bloodied bayonet on the end of a conscript's lasgun. The Imperium's defenders had utilized every strategy, every tactic, anything that might afford them just another few moments against the onslaught of the Swarm. But what ultimately shattered Behemoth was mankind's oldest weapon, its first and its last. Pure, unrestrained hate. In a final sacrifice, Lord Admiral Zacharias Wrath of the Imperial Navy drove his battered and burning flagship, the Emperor-class battleship Dominus Astra, directly into the heart of Behemoth. As the last vestiges of its noble hull were covered beneath the weight of Xenos organisms, the ship detonated its warp drives, and a new star of cataclysmic power briefly flared on the outskirts of the McCrag system. When Kalgar's battle group and the reinforcements from Battlefleet Bracca returned to clear the remaining hive ships from the orbit of McCrag proper, contact had been lost with both of the polar fortresses. The onslaught they had unleashed on the Tyranids before falling silent, however, was obvious. Survivors were eventually found amidst the ruins of the Southern Bastion, while the Imperial relief effort that pushed into the Northern Pole found that the defenders had been killed to a man. The entire Ultramarine's first company had been annihilated, trading their lives for just a few more salvos fired from the fortress's guns. 
behemoth had been shattered, and Macrag saved from total annihilation. But no single battle could bring about an end to Tyranids in the Eastern Fringe. It would be years before the Macrag system was fully cleansed, while the campaigns to similarly clear the surrounding systems and sectors would take centuries and further Imperial armies marshaled from across the galaxy. As mankind's forces retook the systems consumed by Behemoth, their world stripped bare, the full extent of the Tyrannic War became clear. As on Macrag, isolated Imperial fleets and armies had fought heroically throughout the Eastern Fringe, a vital yet overshadowed aspect of the Imperium's defense. But mankind had not fought alone. Evidence was found of an enormous battle between the High Fleet and a collection of Orc freebooters known as the Star Crumpers, whose kill cruisers had long been a major threat to Imperial shipping in the region. Captain Blackgood himself was believed killed, and the greenskin presence in the surrounding region eradicated, albeit temporarily. Renegade elements had also taken up arms against Behemoth, with the notable fortress world of Heretic Astartes likewise consumed during the High Fleet's advance. Particular attention was given to the fate of the Warband's leader, the sorcerer Malifor, who had apparently been driven insane by the sheer power of the Shadow in the Warp. More curious, though, was the fate of Solemnace, a world directly in the path of the Tyranids that the High Fleet astonishingly made deliberate moves to avoid. These reports, and every other bit of data that might be gleaned from the invasion, were relentlessly recorded and transmitted back to Terra. 116 years after the Battle of Macrag, the Ultramarines recorded that they had finally recovered from the losses sustained against High Fleet Behemoth. Their homeworld was likewise rebuilt, and the surrounding sectors repopulated, but the stain of the Tyranids could never be fully removed. Across the Eastern Fringe, there have been sporadic encounters with the remnants of Behemoth, lone Tyranid organisms that have regressed to a more bestial state, or even entire splinter tendrils, left adrift or in hibernation in the dark void between star systems. Yet nothing could erase the most pronounced evidence of the conflict. Hundreds of barren worlds, where once had been teeming masses of humanity. Even so, the High Lords of Terra were quick to judge that the threat of the Tyranids had been ended. This was not the first time a new Xeno species had been encountered, only to be dramatically and violently extinguished. Like the Rangdan Xenocides of the Great Crusade, it was expected that the Tyranid invasion would be just another footnote in Imperial history. Something to be honored, but quietly forgotten. Several across the Imperium suspected otherwise, however, Inquisitor Fidus Cryptman first among them. Too much of the Tyranids remained unexplained, for no further investigation to be conducted. The Bell of Lost Souls, high atop the Tower of Heroes, in the center of the Imperial Palace on Terra, is known to sound whenever the greatest heroes of mankind take their place at the Emperor's side. It rang out in honor of the billions of souls lost to the advance of High Fleet Behemoth. And just as Cryptman suspected, it rang out again to mark those lost some two and a half centuries later against High Fleet Kraken. A mere five years after that, the bell sounded again, this time to mark the devastation of Baal and the supposed defeat of High Fleet Leviathan. Each time the Imperium has declared victory, and each time that declaration has proven premature. As the Fourth Tyrannic War begins, and vast high fleets begin their inexorable advance across the whole of Segmentum Pacificus. The battles of Tyran, Macrag, and all the others are revealed for what they truly were, the opening act of a slaughter that has just begun. A day may come when the skies of holy terror are darkened by clouds of mycetic spores, its great bastions shattered beneath the weight of enormous tendrils that stretch into orbit and the last vestiges of man's presence on its home world are swept away. Perhaps then, the bell of lost souls will sound for the final time, not in honor of some great victory, but as the final act of the human race, as it rages violently, but helplessly, against the dying of the light.
Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this investigation into the first Tyrannic War. Use the link in the description below to mount up and get War Thunder on your platform of choice along with a whole host of bonuses. And remember, whether you find yourself facing alien swarms or hostile armor, big guns never tire.